in a variety of settings. It does not simply take, uh, take place in the classroom, but all over in terms of your life experiences, and we simply should profit from those experiences. So it is with a sense of pride that we begin uh, this presidential lecture this afternoon. We have said that this is a great institution. And we have also pledged that we would produce graduates who, in fact, can be citizens of the world. We have to be responsible for educating you in a global sense. And this is a part of our thrust, our agenda for educating our students here at Medgar Evers College. Although the presidential lecture series may be new to you here at Medgar Evers, it is not something that is not a part, it is a part of most institutions of higher learning. And that is they know that they must bring to the colleges and the university campuses people who can add to that which we already have on our campus in terms of intellectual discussion and discourse and development. So we are pleased that you are here. We want you to have an open mind because that is also important. And to examine what will be said this afternoon, raise questions and you will get an opportunity after the lecture to, to have dialogue with our speaker, Dr. Proctor. At this point in time, I'd like to ask Mr. Keith Brown, who is a student at Medgar Evers College of the City University of New York and a staff person in the freshman year program to bring the invocation and then we will be followed by the, the singing of the Negro National Anthem led by Ms. Cynthia Gray and accompanied on the uh, piano by Mrs. Marcia Powell who is director of our college discovery program here at this institution.
Now remember that we require that you learn this song. <laughs> and then sing it. it. The words are beautiful. They speak to our struggle and they speak to where we are today. And we are standing on the shoulders of some wonderful people. And you should never forget the words of this beautiful song. Our lecturer this afternoon is the Dr. Samuel D. Proctor, who is a renowned minister, scholar, educator, and author. He's a native of my home state, Virginia. He holds many degrees and finally received a doctor of theology degree at Boston University. He also is the recipient of at least 22 honorary doctorate degrees from some of the most prestigious universities and colleges in this country. He has served as president of two historically black colleges and university in the South. He has been a dean at the University of Wisconsin. He has served as a senior officer in the Peace Corps for Africa under the Kennedy administration. He has held the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Chair at Rutgers University, my alma mater. And now is Professor Emeritus of that wonderful university. Dr. Proctor has retired from the Abyssinian Baptist Church and he followed Reverend Alvin Clayton Power, a distinguished leader. And now he's about doing the kinds of things that he would like to do as a visiting professor at Duke University, working and serving as a visiting professor at Virginia University in Virginia. He is a person that cares deeply for others. He is a person that lives his speeches and his talks. I don't know if you know it or not, but he has a lot of little Samuel D. Witt Proctor running around all throughout these United States. I'm one of those. When he was at Rutgers University, he, unlike some, saw the need and knew that there was an opportunity to provide the entree for a lot of minority and women educators to come to Rutgers University to obtain their doctorate degrees. And I am sure that there are over 100 or plus individuals that Dr. Proctor has shepherded through Rutgers University and there are, and to his credit, there are others like me and Dr. Johnny Youngblood who did not graduate from Rutgers but also received his doctorate under the tutelage of Dr. Proctor. 
Here is a man who is using his God-given talents to lift up our people. He is a man of vision, man of wisdom, man of compassion. He has a passion for learning and education. And he is one of our greatest educators and philosophers of these times. And I'm not suggesting black educator or philosopher, but that can be limiting when we say that. But rather as a renowned person who meets all the standards of greatness. He's in the class of a Du Bois, a Carter G. Woodson, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Medgar Evers. All of these individuals had influence where he is today and what he has done. He is one who understands that there are no constraints that can be imposed upon our minds but those that we impose upon ourselves. We welcome my friend, my mentor, Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor. I am very grateful to President Jackson for these most generous words of introduction. And I am delighted and honored to be here with you today and to be with the members of the administrative staff with whom I've already had fellowship at lunch, and uh, members of the faculty and you of the student body in whose interest all of this has been established. This is not my first uh, visit to the college. I have been here two or three times before, and I have always been inspired by the spirit, the hospitality of this place, and by the expressions on your faces. You look like you are in school and you're glad to be here and you have great expectations for yourselves and for your institution. And that's to be highly uh, commended. Your president was a student of mine. I beat his brains out over there. I wore him out. And he has come through shining like a star. I'm so proud of him, I don't know what to do. And Dr. Davis over here at York College was one of our students, too, in the same program. I think I have about 104 uh, persons who went through the doctoral program at Rutgers with me, and I am so grateful that I was given an opportunity to work with these fine young people. And uh, what an honor it was to have lunch once again with uh, the Dean of Students and with Dr. Shabazz, uh, for whose husband I have the highest regard and gratitude for his fine work uh, during his brief lifetime. I want to tell you one thing about Medgar Evers to help you to understand uh, the person uh, whose name adorns this institution. Don't ever forget about Medgar Evers. Let me say one thing to you. When I was associate director of the Peace Corps, I went to Jackson, Mississippi to ask Medgar Evers, would he please hold up on everything and go with me to Africa to help direct the Peace Corps in Nigeria. I wanted him to be based in Lagos in Nigeria to help young African students to understand the civil rights movement and to inspire them, knowing about his life and his witness. And Medgar told me he would think about it and uh, pray about it, and in about three or four days, he called me up. And he said to me, Sam, I would really like to go to Nigeria with you. He said, but this is 1963, and I don't think I can leave Mississippi now. He was deeply involved in the struggle there. We had a nice job for him, a nice salary, and had a nice home, and a wonderful opportunity to extend his career. But he told me no. But he said, later, when we are farther along the road, I would be happy to consider that. And as fate would have it, 
before we ever were able to have him with us in Africa, as you well know, he was assassinated in a very brutal murder there in Jackson, Mississippi. But that's the kind of person whose name will be on your diploma when you graduate. Medgar Evers, a person who selflessly gave himself for the liberation of our people. And that was my experience with him, trying to get him to go. I didn't want him to stay over there. I said to him, I want you to get a respite, to get some time off for renewal, you and your family, your wife and children, then come back refreshed. But he was so committed to that that he did not want to be absent even for a short while. Now I want to speak to you on this subject. Let's see if we can keep it in mind. I don't want to stray from it. The subject is the future is now. The future is now. This subject comes to me when I think about a book that I read as a graduate student called Democracy in America. The book was written by a man named Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville. He was a Frenchman who came over here in the 1800s to study America's prisons. He was going to be the director of prisons in France, and he came to America to see how we did it over here. But when he got here, he was more attracted to the topic of black people than he was to the topic of prisons. And de Tocqueville went all over the Southland looking into the faces of the slaves and asking himself the question, what on earth is going to happen to them when once they are set free? De Tocqueville saw four million slaves all over Alabama, Mississippi, Virginia, and North Carolina. And in his mind as a visitor from France, he said to himself, no way. These people will never make it in America. So he wrote his book, Democracy in America. He made three predictions in that book. One prediction was that America and Russia would become the two great world powers, and that prediction came true. He made another prediction that we would have to be concerned about what he called the tyranny of the majority. He meant by that that there would come a time in America when certain ideas would just flood the whole country that would destroy our freedoms because the majority would hold these ideas and impose them on the rest of us. He said uh, we had certain constitutional rights to protect us from this but he said there's a big danger that those rights will not be sufficient. So he said America will have to watch out for this, the tyranny of the majority. That is when the majority can have a wrong idea and impose it on the rest of us. Now the future that Mr. de Tocqueville was talking about is right now. <laughs> We're living in that future right now. I wish I could wake him up. Do you wish you could wake I wish I could wake him up. Wake up, de Tocqueville, baby. I want to talk to you. <laughs> I'd like to say, Mr. de Tocqueville, Your Excellency, we're still here. We didn't go anywhere but downtown, that's all. We haven't gone anywhere. We didn't die. We didn't all go stone crazy. We didn't commit suicide. We didn't all drink ourselves to death. Not all of us became intoxicated with drugs and things like that, no. And not all of us succumbed to that stereotype that they shaped and formed about us. Not all of us believed what they said about us, no. Some of us took the option to believe differently about ourselves. And Mr. De Tocqueville, we are still here. We are still here. Now you should listen to me as I talk about this because I have something that you need. You know what that is? I started teaching in black colleges, Virginia Union and a and and became president of Virginia Union and a and 20 years before the Civil Rights Movement. I started in 49, huh? 
And then in 69, I went to Rutgers. So that means I had 20 years before I ever came to a large, predominantly white institution in the North. Huh? 49 to 69. And then from 69 to 89, I was in a large, predominantly white institution in the North. That means I have seen this whole situation from two perspectives. On the one hand, 20 years as a black college professor in a black school and a black president. On the other hand, watching how a big university behaved. And since leaving Rutgers in my retirement, I've taught at Vanderbilt for a year, and now I'm down at Duke for this year. I'm seeing even more of this. So with this perspective that I have, I am so pleased and so happy that I have an opportunity to share with you what appears to me to be the reality. And I'm saying these things in response to Mr. de Tocqueville. He was wrong. He thought that there would be no place for us. What he did not understand was that we were not pigs, chickens, goats, cows, hogsheads of tobacco, you know, bags of flour. We were persons. We were creatures of God, fully persons. Though they denied us education, we still had minds, capacity to comprehend and to think, to reason, capacity to make predictions, to assess our choices and options, and to, and to look at consequences. We were reasoning people. We had used all of this equipment to survive the slave institution for 244 years. He, like many others, thought that we were some kind of subhuman animals and that if they turned us out of slavery, we would just, you know, like snails, just melt somehow and drop out of sight. He didn't know how tall we could stand. He didn't know we were going to produce some leaders to bring us through. He didn't see any of that. And I wish so much that I could get this generation of college students to understand what the mentality was of a man like de Tocqueville, what he thought, and what kind of burden we have to prove that he was dead wrong. When I look into your faces, you're so young, you have so much lying ahead of you. I think of some of the students that I had. I had a young man in my philosophy class at uh, Virginia Union uh, who was always late for class. He was late for class because he was busting dishes down at the John Marshall Hotel for lunch, and you know, he had to stay there till all the dishes were cleaned up, and then he would come to class. He would come to class smelling bad, sweating, all dirty and grimy, but he was there. And then he would often go to sleep, ha, because he'd been up late the night before, serving a banquet in the same hotel. You would never guess who that person was who was late for my class and who slept in my philosophy class. You know who that was? <laughs> no, it was not Edison, guys. It was L. Douglas Wilder. Who is he? The governor of Virginia. Huh? Did you hear what I said, brother? You looking at the professor in whose class Doug Wilder went to sleep. <laughs> and when I see him now, I say to him, Doug Wilder, now you see why I used to make you wake up? Because one day I thought you would amount to something. The governor of Virginia used to fall asleep in my philosophy. Now, I had another tall, skinny fellow used to follow me around all the time at A&T with a big round head and pop eyes. And he had a lisp tongue. He couldn't pronounce some kind of word. Just, you know, talk like a snake hissing us. You know who that was? Reverend Jesse Jackson. Oh, yes, Jesse. Jesse was the president of my student body and the quarterback of my football team but he couldn't play football. <laughs> he could play football, but he didn't want to get tackled. He was so pretty, he didn't want his face all scarred up. So when they came after him to tackle him, he would run into the stands, you know, run out of bounds. 
when I see him now, I tell him that his uniform was the only uniform after the game that we did not have to get clean because it was so clean it had not been in the dirt at all. In fact, I'm wearing a watch that Jesse presented to me when he was president of the student body. On the back of it, it says, presented to Samuel D. Proctor by the a and student body in 1964. When I came back from Africa, he presented that to me. So now, if I had Mr. de Tocqueville standing here next to me, I would say, you know, Mr. de Tocqueville, you said we weren't going to make it. But I had a fellow in my class who was a grandson of slaves. Now he's the governor of Thomas Jefferson's Virginia. And another one born down there in Greenville, South Carolina, a teenage mother raised by his mother and his grandmother. One of those statistics that would predict that he was not going to be very much in this society. Came to college with nothing, nothing but a handful of gimme and a mouthful of much oblige. <laughs> and graduated. We sent him out to Chicago Theological Seminary. And he's the first black person to become a serious contender for the presidency of these United States. So Mr. de Tocqueville, you said that we would never survive the emancipation. We would just dissolve and drop out of sight. But that has not happened to us at all. I just read in the paper that Oprah made $98 million in the last two years. Born in Mississippi, did not know who her father was. Yes, raised by her mother, subjected to all kinds of abuse as a teenage girl. Now here she is, the most sensational television personality in the world. Born in Mississippi in poverty, born without knowing who her father was. Mr. de Tocqueville, you were so wrong in saying that we couldn't make it in this country. They tell me General Colin Powell might run for president. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Black boy born and reared in New York City, West Indian background and parentage, huh? Became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Mr. de Tocqueville, you were so wrong. You said we weren't going to make it at all, and, and here we are, here we are. So the future that he talked about is right now. And you and I together have got to prove that he was ever so wrong and show him that we know how to secure our future. We know how to find our place in this society. We know how to meet the requirements for success. And we know how to grow up in America without adopting all of the vulgarity, all of the materialism, all of the gender and race discrimination, all of the class discrimination. We know how to become a part of this society and help to make it whole. Clap for that. Yes. We would like to say to him, not only did we survive in this society, but we are here to stay. We're not going anywhere. And our intention is not to be totally adapted and grafted on, but to become participants in the society to help bring about the most marvelous community that the world has ever seen. No other nation in the world has had the opportunity that America has. We have the greatest diversity of any people anywhere. And in that diversity, we have our largest minority who suffered two and a half centuries of chattel slavery. I'm not talking about the kind of slavery in the New Testament where Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon. No, not that kind of slavery. Not the slavery that Plato talked about in the dialogue, the Mino. No, I'm talking about selling folks at auction like animals on a street corner. That kind of slavery. We had that. No other nation in the world ever had to start out like that and then try to become a free society with democracy, with equality, with fairness, and with the highest standard of living in the world. 
Nobody ever tried that before. We've not perfected it yet, but I tell you my heart is filled with hope that I will be around to see us move much closer to it than we are right now. And when I see you here in college and not out there in the street raising hell and destroying yourselves, I know we're going to get there. And you're going to be participants in it. Now I want to summarize and tell you how and why I know it and what I would like for Mr. de Tocqueville to have to reckon with. And then when I'm finished, you ask me the questions you want to. No question can be embarrassing. You're in school. You paid tuition. Oh, I guess you did. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and any question you want to ask, I will try to stand and answer. Here's how we're going to do it. First of all, we're going to affirm the notion that all of us are somebody precious in God's sight, no matter what the society defines us as, no matter what society says we are. We know we're not a bag of chemicals. We know we're more than phosphorus, you know, and calcium. We know we're more than amino acids and deoxyribonucleic acids. We're persons in whom God has breathed God's spirit. We're persons. We are persons with capacity, with aesthetic sensitivity, with memory, with reasoning capacity, and we know how to use this subjunctive mood in grammar, don't we? Yes. The subjunctive mood in grammar. That's what distinguishes the losers from the winners, you see. Those who do not know the subjunctive mood are in deep trouble. You see, if you live in indicative mood all the time, that just says what you're going to do, what you did, without any conditions. I came, I paid my toll on the Verrazano Bridge, you know, I came on the Goffles Bridge, not the Verrazano Bridge. And uh, I'm here, I had lunch today, a beautiful piece of salmon steak, you know, and had a good... I came, I saw, and I'm going to go back home. That's all indicative. You live like a German shepherd dog, doing what comes next, that's all. That's the indicative mood. Then there's the imperative mood. You know what that is? Doing what folk make you do. Go to the lecture, bam, go. <laughs> imperative mood. Take notes, bam. You gotta go. You gotta hang in there. You know, pay taxes, die. The imperative mood. Do what folk make you do. But then there is the subjunctive mood that invites you to consider your options, your choices. The subjunctive mood says, I may go, but I may not go. I may say what you think I'm going to say, but after I consider my values, I may change and say something else. I may meet you tonight where you've asked me to meet you, but after I consult my value system, I may veto that suggestion and I may do something else with my life because I am a subjunctive human being. I make choices and I have freedom and I use my freedom. Now, if you don't have the subjunctive mood under command, you don't know how to take advantage of new opportunities. You don't know how to hang in your college course when things get going rough. You don't know how to bounce back when you get a bad grade on a test or a paper's returned as poorly written, you know. Uh, you don't know how to behave. You see, if you, if you live in indicative mood, in imperative mood, you can't survive that. But if you live in the subjunctive mood, you're always asking yourself the big question, therefore, therefore, huh? Nevertheless, notwithstanding, See, some folk only know the whereas, as you know, whereas, <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas, whereas, you know. But some folk keep on going until they get to the last whereas, and then they say, nevertheless, notwithstanding. On the other hand, therefore, see, some folk have a therefore, but they've got the wrong therefore. <laughs> and make fools of themselves. So when you live in a subjunctive mood, you learn how to handle your options and your freedom. Now, you know, that was the toughest thing for me to learn when I was young because I didn't have people around me to tell me that. I wish somebody told me when I'm telling you when I was in college, 
sitting there like a wild little dumb sophomore at Virginia State College, trying to be cute, you know, slouched all down in his seat with my sunglasses on, you know, ignoring what was going on, you know, I thought I had it made. All I wanted was a Chevrolet with a white canvas top, wire spoke wheels, and a Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity pin, yeah, and a varsity letter from Virginia State, and get out of there and go back to Norfolk, riding in my Chevrolet, showing my fraternity pin, wearing my letter, with a pretty girl sitting in there beside me, just cruising up and down Church Street. I didn't care how long I could cruise up and down Church Street. It didn't occur to me what I would do when I got through cruising up and down Church Street. I thought in short terms, you know, just tomorrow, that's all, not long term, making a pure fool of myself, you know. But thank God I began to listen to some people, some people who'd been this way before and who had some goals and ideas about the future. And they convinced me that I could do anything I wanted to do. And I got my ragged self together, and I got myself together so completely that I changed colleges. I left Virginia State because I didn't think my buddies were gonna let me live out my change. Did you hear what I said? Yes. And I went to Virginia Union. And when I was there, I made two B's in my last two years. I made all A's. Two B's, and I wish I had the professor by the throat who gave me those two B's. <laughs> yes, and I'm talking about Latin and Greek and all of that stuff. I was predatory, I was voracious. I wanted to learn everything I could learn. I was on a roll. Went straight on through to my doctor's degree, and my daddy didn't have a dime to give me. I'm talking about I worked my way all the way through washing dishes, scrubbing floors, waiting table, driving truck, working in the post office. And when I graduated, had 700 and some dollars in my pocket and got married. <laughs> huh? Yes, yes. And you know one thing? Let me tell you something. I have not been unemployed since I was nine years old, and I've never been broke since I was nine years old. See? Now, what I want to say to you is this. If you know you're somebody, you think you're somebody, you will demand that of yourself, and you will deliver. Mr. de Tocqueville didn't know that, that we had the capacity to internalize the truth and to use our imagination and to lay hold on the subjunctive mood and live out that sense of perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. That's the future you're living in right now. I invite you to get with it and prove that Mr. de Tocqueville was wrong. Now, the next thing is we can do and learn what anybody else can do and learn. Over here at Rutgers in Newark, beside Smith Hall, there's a deep trench dug right in the sidewalk. If you pass by there, you'll say, what is this trench out here for? It's 10 feet wide, 70 feet long, and with concrete walls three feet thick. What is this trench out here for in the middle of Newark by Smith Hall on the Rutgers campus? Well, the trench is there because AT&T has built a laboratory for laser research. <laughs> Over a million dollars for this laboratory for laser research for a black physicist named Dr. Shaw, huh? who's a black physicist. He is now about to break new ground in the study of particles. He's a laser physicist, world-class laser physicist. Where was he born? Clarksdale, Mississippi. Not right in town, outside of town. You might have read about him in the Parade magazine about three or four months ago. Now my wife has a son. Me too, I mean, it's our son. <laughs> we have a son. We have a son who is an attorney. And uh, after a little while working in New York for one major chemical company, he was invited to join the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world. I can't believe this. His granddaddy 
couldn't even go to a pharmacy school, couldn't fill a prescription for anybody but black folk and black physicians. Here his grandson is the vice president of the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world and supervises 54 lawyers for that company. What on earth would happen if his grandpa could wake up and say, son, what did you say? He said, grandpa, I'm the vice president of the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world, and I'm in charge of all of its legal work. I wish I could wake him up and tell him that, and I could wish also I could wake up Mr. de Tocqueville and tell him too. God bless you. Thank you very much.